So more and more schools are now starting to do POCs and trials and deployments of CBRS. They're essentially connecting the students on their own network. Hey guys, welcome to Embedded Toolbox, the video interview series where we try to save the world by solving one engineering challenge at a time. And this week, we're really trying to save the world by honing in on the education sector and connectivity. To help us out with that, we brought on Daniel Quant of Multitech. How are you doing, Daniel? Yeah, good, Brandon. Nice to be here today. Obviously, the pandemic has reshaped a lot of industries, um, and it's also reshaped the education market. We're now all of these students are being forced to learn remotely, and that has a lot of implications on network connectivity, especially in lower income situations or very rural situations where people may not be able to afford or have access to the, the necessary uh, network resources, services, and bandwidth to connect to learn. Um, what are you seeing as the opportunities in that market and how organizations are trying to connect students today and what's wrong with it? Yeah, traditionally, a lot of schools gave away um, a MiFi park or, uh, or a router or something of this nature. And, um, and certainly in more, um, more city and suburban areas where there's great coverage from the big MNOs, um, this, this certainly is a, an approach that can work and, and has worked for many of the school districts. But of course, it comes at quite an expensive cost, right? Um, that OPEX cost, you and I, you know, we pay it on our mobile phones too, right? So, you know, cost is, can, can vary between operators, but, you know, let's just say $30, right, per month in order to have um, a good few gigs worth of a data plan that you can use. Um, then you multiply that up maybe by a thousand students, these contracts are usually 36 months, right? So 30 times 1,000 times 36. I mean, you're over a million dollars over three years um, connecting those um, 1,000 students. And so what we've started to see is that the FCC's liberalization of the mid-band spectrum, and so I really you know, take my hat off there to the FCC, um, they've liberalized 150 megahertz of that spectrum between 3.55 and 3.7 gigahertz. And, um, and it's, you know, lovingly called CBRS band. And deployments are happening all over the country for lots of different reasons, you know, oil and gas, utilities, um, sports venues, uh, public operators, cable providers, a lot of different um, applications are being deployed in that band. And this hasn't been missed by some of the school districts. They've seen the opportunity now that they could also deploy their own network they have um, assets in their schools where they can put base stations and do sometimes um, already on, on tops of buildings. Um, they obviously work closely with the municipality. So there's other areas in that school district that perhaps they can put um, a, a small base station on. And they can then attempt to try to connect, like you say, um, underserved members of the community, uh, 14 or so percent of American children just don't have an internet connection. And, and between 30 to 40 percent of children, which is a real staggering number, um, don't have a very good connection. They can't do what we're doing now, Brandon. They, they can't get on Zoom and, and, and have this kind of quality call. Um, so the guys in, in the city, generally uh, underserved communities, um, and then other types of underserved communities, but in rural environments where the business case to even do fixed wireless access is not there. So more and more schools are now starting to do POCs and trials and deployments of CBRS. They're essentially connecting the students on their own network. And, and it has a number of benefits, right? Um, for sure, it moves that needle to a more CapEx driven um, model, which Typically, these schools are starting to see a return on investment within two years or so, or at least calculated in, in two years. And, and of course, it's a private network. It, their children are off the internet. 
what are the options then? You obviously want something that's lower cost that you can distribute um, throughout this private network, and you want something that's uh, probably mobile and portable so that students can use, uh, you know, access connectivity wherever they are because we're assuming they're going to be moving around. Um, what's Multitech doing on that front, and what do you see in the future there? We have three products today that are all FCC authorized and, uh, and being used by a number of stakeholders, in, including um, school districts as well and, and universities. So this one um, that I'm holding up here, um, this is called a multi-connect microcell. And as you can see, it has a USB connection on it, a type A connector, so that goes in pretty much any type of notebook, whether it be Windows or Linux based type system or even a, a Mac or, or a Chromebook and it's really the Chromebook that we see being used most often by the school districts. Those Chromebooks can come in as little as uh, less than $200. Um, if you can imagine I'm on my computer right now so in it goes and um, plugs into the USB and um, within a, a few seconds or so camps on the uh, CBRS network thereby giving you connectivity. By having the external antennas, you get a little bit of extra performance. It's a fairly um, robust design. So for sure, you know, children aren't gonna sit on it and crack the plastic or anything. So, so it sits in very nicely into the computer and gives you uh, connectivity from a Chromebook, for example, directly to a, a network that might be a, um, a half a mile, a mile away perhaps on a tower outside here. Let's pretend now, Daniel, that you are either a student or maybe you work for a school district and you're at a student's house and you're implementing this network for them. Um, let's, how, how would we get started? How easy is it and what's the performance look like? I start off by doing an IP config. There's nothing plugged in. So that would be me putting the antennas on. Then at some point, I plug it in. It takes a little while for my computer to see that the USB has had that device plugged in. The assets start to identify themselves. There's four, uh, two um, virtual ethernet ports, right? One of them is for debugging and stuff. The other one is what the data uh, throughput is gonna come through on. You see me do another IP config and you start to see some addresses starting to resolve. They're, they change. Um, but something is happening, right? Then it asked me, do you want to have a shared network? So yes, I do. And then you IP configure again, and now you're starting to get more um, progress on, on that second interface, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, I have to do it again, because um, I, I think it's this one ends up getting a, an IP address as well. So look up there, it's 192.168.15.147. But by the time it's fully done, when that blinky blinky light is happening, then it's picked up the IP address from the cloud that is connected to the CBSD. So it's picking that up from the EPC, right? I ping a well-recognized IP address, right? Because it's easier than resolving a web address. And then this is the multi-tech connection manager that I just clicked on back there. And I'm just going through a couple of the screens so that people can see it. You see that same, oops, you see that same IP address there is the IP address here and the subnet mask and the DNS server, all this stuff from the EPC is all set up at 888 and, and, and you see the IMEI and everything. And then I go through the terminal screen. I don't really do much, but if you type PT, you get a response from the modem. And, uh, and then there's a little chart here. I press that go button and now start looking at the downlink performance as it starts to kick in. So it's starting, it's about, oh, there it goes, 12 meg, 70 meg, 75 meg. And, you know, we're seeing, remember, this is raw data, right? This is perhaps application layer. So they're never going to be exactly the same. This one's also averaging, whereas this one is instantaneous. But, you know, it was all ballpark similar numbers. And now you see the um, uplink going. In this particular video, I couldn't get much on the uplink. So performance of these devices are pretty good. This is an LTE CAT6 device. And so 
Uh, we've tested it at well over 100 megabits per second um, with an uplink of you know, 20 megabits and, and more. So certainly for home learning, that CAT6 modem is more than enough. Of, of course, the network itself has to be dimensioned to, to be able to have the density and be able to offer connectivity to obviously more than one device. So, so it's not all just about the device, it's about the network too. Um, but typically these school districts are shooting for 25 down and by above. Um, with, with that kind of performance, you can do Zoom, uh, go to meeting, Microsoft Teams. You can perhaps log into educational platforms and, and listen to content and, and movies about um, maths or English or what have you. And, and of course, you're more than able to get your email. That's, that's fantastic. But one of the things that we need to deal with here and one of the obvious advantages of using CBRS is that you're able to be a little bit more mobile than if you're just working off of a Wi-Fi access point. So how does it perform in that regard? How mobile um, can you be? Well, yeah, you can be as mobile as you can possibly enjoy with, with a public cellular connection. So I also had the same um, concerns, right? So I only got a half a watt base station in my house. So I got a half a watt Ruckus uh, base station, which is fine for a small enterprise or Soho facility. But don't be confused with what you see out in the middle of the, uh, the, the, the freeways and, and, and the tops of buildings. They're, you know, they're much more powerful. They're 50 watt output base stations. So, so bear that in mind, right? So, uh, so I left my house, um, I did some testing in my garden, you could see the Wi-Fi at 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, and you could also see the CBRS signal. I moved out towards the back of my garage um, uh, in the alleyway down there, and, and I did a test where I walked off, and, and pretty quickly the 2.4 gig is gone. I mean, you can see uh, the signals there, but you just can't get on it. And then a little bit after that, the five um, gig has gone. But when I was doing this with, with the CBRS Ongo microcell here, um, I was able to go all the way to the end of my block and around the corner. And this is so classic cellular, right? And the data rate comes down, but you remain connected. You're connected, always transferring data until you hit cell edge. And as soon as you hit that cell edge, laws of physics, you just, you go, right? But there's none of this, oh, you know, I can see a signal, but I can't quite get on it. Uh, I could get on it yesterday, but I can't get it on it today. Uh, instead, pretty reliable connectivity as far as I could walk a block or so away from my house, which considering that half a watt base station is in my house and it's not optimally placed or anything, I was pretty impressed by that. Yeah. So here what we have is we have obviously the benefits of a private network. We have enough bandwidth to be, um, you know, dangerous in the use cases in question for the education sector, which leaves really the question that you brought up earlier about cost you know obviously uh, this isn't free uh, somebody's got to pay for it and we're talking about underprivileged underserved um the you know, potential consumers here so that would likely fall to the school district or whatever other local government um may want to get involved so how did they you know get recoup their investment you know what are they looking at uh to afford something like this for a normal size school so this year was, was well, you know, a, uh, quite an extraordinary year. You know? and, um, and so there was the CARES Act, right? And, um, and, and the CARES Act was a huge sum of money. And, and, and education, I believe, got, you know, uh, some billions of that, one, two, three billion dollars of that went into education. And a lot of the school districts have, you know, spent their allocation on that on that CARES Act, and, and some of them spent it on deploying infrastructure, Wi-Fi in infrastructure, I'm sure they were very familiar with that inside their facilities, but for remote learning, some of those school districts used that um, budget. So, so there were definitely some grants there that were used um, to, to offset that initial investment. But you can see it makes good sense, right? Because, um, even within three years, we saw cost models where um, there was a return on investment. 
quicker than three years. And, and certainly after three years with, um, with a traditional telco model, then you know, maybe you get upgraded with a new device or something or, or credits for that. Um, but you're back into the monthly deal again. Whereas with the network, yeah, all right, there's some ongoing costs with the ISP, some firmware updates, maybe some upgrades in years to come to 5G, but you retain your investment. So, you, you know, in the second three-year period of time, if you want to measure it like that, that the outgoings are far less. Well, that's awesome. And I, this is a great story, Daniel, and I hope that all of our viewers are able to see how this could be used uh, not only for their own neighborhoods and communities, but also in other applications as well. You mentioned at the top, you know, the school districts were looking at other other industries like oil and gas, uh, other places that use um, private private uh, cellular networks as, as a model. And obviously this sort of technology applies there as well. Yeah, it's a very powerful model. Um, in a sense, I feel like we've come to the end of the beginning. The beginning was 30 years and, and it saw um, just a few rich, what were they called back then? Yuppies with mobile <laughs> phones turn into a whole planet of people using mobile phones. And then industry and um, container tracking, being able to track things all around the world. It took 30 years, but we did all of this with cellular technology. But, but now we're, we're about to move into the second chapter of cellular communication. And this is about cellular being used like Wi-Fi was used the last 20 years by small, medium-sized businesses, enterprises, energy companies, sports venues, education, warehousing. I mean, it, it crosses every segment of society. And, and that's why I really raised my hat earlier on to the FCC that made this possible by liberalizing and sharing 150 meg of prime mid-band spectrum for us to use. That's great. So, uh, Daniel, if this planet full of yuppies wants to find out more about multi-tech and where to go um, to learn more about CBRS, what's the URL? www.multitech.com. Thanks. <laughs>